guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to be doing another update video on the Ranger build. We have a lot of progress to share with you guys in this one. Christian's been absolutely cranking on the truck. Before we get into it though, let's see if we can get this video to 800 likes. So go down and hit the like button. Also, if you have any questions or comments regarding the build, Christian and I are gonna be going through all of those and commenting and replying to all those. So go down there, leave a comment, and we'll get back to you on that. But as always, we have Christian to show us through the truck and <laughs> We have a lot to go through today. Yeah, so the last video that you guys saw on this thing, there was literally nothing on the front of this truck. It was still factory firewall and then just frame rail, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So in the last video at the very end, if you guys watched that one, you saw we had all the plate work for the beam kit uh, cut and ready to go. And then now you can see that entire kit is on the truck. So yes. it's been a little bit since Jake's been able to come down here to film a video. So. We didn't get necessarily anything of the kit going together, but we can, we're obviously gonna walk through right now and show the actual kit on the truck um, and show you guys how all that stuff looks all assembled now. Right, and typically we do go front to back when we're doing kind of the walkthroughs, but I think we should go literally piece by piece front to back since there's so much that has been done. Mm -hmm. So first you do have this, the stock bumper on here, not the stock one, but the one that was on the truck originally. The old front bumper, yeah. I know we talked about this, but do you want to explain kind of why that's on there still? Yeah, so like you could see in the last video, it still had like the, the skid plate tubes in here and then the, the piece that dropped down to tie the two frame rails together underneath. But um, right now, the, the portion that's still here, all it's doing is literally just keeping these frame rails together so nothing moves around. And it was realistically, it can come out now, now that I have this tube in here, just kind of holding the frame rails at the width that it's set at. But I just don't want anything moving around, especially now that all the, uh, the steering geometry set up. Definitely. If those frame rails pull in or out at all, which realistically they're going to pull in, if anything, um, it's going to screw up the toe. It's going to screw up all the geometry on the steering and then it'll introduce bump steer. So I'm leaving this stuff here for now until I start building at least the engine cage structure to come in and tie into the frame rails to hold it in place before I cut any of this stuff, this stuff off. So, so the steering box before in the last video is literally just bolted to the factory location. Um, now that the, the steering or at least 90% of the steering is in place, uh, the steering box had to get moved up because of the tie rod clearance at full compression and full lock. So the, the, to determine all that stuff, like the big factor for how the steering got laid out is it's all straight tie rods and to be able to run straight tie rods, you have a lot of clearance issues. Yeah. So, yeah. So with the tie rods, the reason that we do want those to be straight is because if they have any sort of bends in them, it's just going to be easier to deflect when it's on the truck. And we also run very thick wall tubing. Mm -hmm. And Christian has an example right here that we can kind of talk about. Yeah. What's the tubing strategy for the tie rods on yeah, this? Yeah. So truck? all the tie rods on this, the main portion of the tie rod is all inch and a quarter, 250 wall tubing, and it's all 4130. And then the outside edges is inch and a half, 120. And then the bung slides into that inch and a half. So it, it, everything is butted together on the inside, like the bung meets up perfectly like up against the, the inch and a quarter 250 wall tubing. And then this sleeve goes over the top of it. And then you can see there's a rosette here and a rosette here tying those two pieces together. So the bung and the, the inside, like the main portion of the tie rod. And then there's four of those plug welds on all that stuff. And then where, that, the, uh, where those two meet together, I do, basically it's a notch and then you weld the notch portion of it. So it's not just a straight cut because that creates like a sheer point, like a sheer point on mm -hmm. that tie rod yep. or anything that you're doing. If it's an upper link, whatever it is where you're, you're sleeving tubing like that, if you leave just a straight cut and you weld that to it, that is a sheer point on what you're doing. So you always want to add some sort of like shape to it. And a notch is typically like the most convenient way to do it to get that weird shape out of it. And um, it also like one, it serves a structural purpose yeah. and two, it also looks really good and adds some style to the top. Yep to the tie rods as well. Yeah, so that that is like our go-to for all tie rods. Um, it's all inch and a quarter 250 wall. I think if I had the option to be able to, to run a tap through the end of the, the tie rods, I wouldn't do like this sleeve setup, but because of the tooling that we have here, um, I just do the sleeve on the ends and we haven't had a single problem doing it this yep. way, so. How long did the steering take on the truck? I wanna say like start to finish to get it to where it's at with remounting the steering box, building the custom pitman arm, which we'll look at in a second, and then the tie rods, swingers, and then the steering arms off the spindles, I wanna say I had like a week and a half to two weeks. Which is really impressive. Like- It went from a month on our truck when we did it. <laughs> I think I think we got it done a little bit quicker than that. This is definitely faster though. Yeah. So that just shows that from us doing this on other vehicles and you kind of learning quicker ways to get around things, mm -hmm. especially getting the bump steer out of these. So that's realistically what takes the longest amount of time. 
like having a good plan of going through that is going to save you so much time. Yeah, there's multiple things. So like introduce, like with the straight tie rod setup, you run into a lot of issues with clearance. Um, that's one issue. Another thing too is making sure you have enough steering angle that comes into play. Mm -hmm. Because when you go to equal length steering like this, and then you start extending steering arms to be able to get everything to clear that it ne the way it needs to, you start losing steering angle if you're not being careful. So mm -hmm. like taking that into account and site, like I cycled, all this stuff is hand built, but I made the swingers in the computer and then I, I built the spindle in the computer and I was doing ratios to make sure we were getting enough steering angle before I like finalized all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, that was also something to take into account. And then just this this whole setup, it, outside of just getting the geometry correct as far as bump steer, like there's a lot that goes into packaging this stuff on the front of these trucks. So yep. it definitely takes a lot of time doing it just from doing it previously. You, you learn a lot from doing it every single time. So it just becomes faster and faster and it becomes second nature. But this stuff definitely takes a lot of time and that's the most time consuming thing on the front of these trucks yep. by far. And like just a few things to keep in mind, like we won't go through completely how to build the steering because we could be here for a while doing long that. Time, yeah. yeah, one of those things is having a long enough steering arm. If you, the longer you make, the longer you make this, the slower your steering ratio is gonna be. So you can't have it be too long, but you need to have it enough to where everything's staggered between all of the tie rods to where you're not getting any collision issues there. And then you can also affect your steering ratio through the swinger itself. So you gotta keep that stuff in mind as well. And like Christian said, he mocked all this up in Fusion 360, and then he could tell what the ratio was going to be on the truck to where it wasn't was going to be going ridiculous. Off the tire. So like, I know with our truck, we're kind of limited on steering angle, but that being the first truck that we did, like we didn't, we weren't fully comprehending what was going into that. And then once the truck was done, we we're like, oh man, like we don't have very much steering angle. So yep. I knew on this truck, I wanted to get more. Um, and we're right around like that 26 ish, 26 degree range on this truck. Um, which isn't too bad, but um, you're definitely limited going to a setup like this in comparison to like a factory truck. It's very limited. Yes. Yep. And one thing that you also do to help with that and to help with getting more up travel is notching the frame mm -hmm. for that swinger and for the tie rods. Yeah. So like this side, again, with having straight tie rods, when this thing comes up to full compression, which the beam basically touches the bottom of the frame on this thing. So it's bottoming out as far as it can possibly go. Um, the tie rod, when it comes to full compression and full turn, you end up having a problem with this tie rod wanting to, to kiss the bottom of the frame quite a, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So this truck and same with ours, like we ended up notching the frame out to have the tie rod clear here. And then also on this setup, this swinger also has a pocket here to be able to turn as much as it needs to, to get that extra steering angle out of the truck. Yep. And again, just going back to the tie rods, it, it's mostly critical on this side with the steering arm length. Where as you go up and travel, the steering arm has to be far enough out to where this tie rod doesn't have any issues hitting this beam pivot. Mm -hmm. And that's also why we add angle and inclination to these beam pivots is to not have any issues with clearance there. Yeah, so uh, that's another thing too. So the amount of um, caster that we have built into this truck, when everything cycles up to full compression, everything's coming backwards. Mm -hmm. So you're gaining caster when you do that. So the steering arm and all of this stuff ends up going back towards the back of the truck. Yep. So this passenger side tire ends up coming closer to your driver side beam pivot. Yep. So everything like there's a lot that goes into like the thought of this, you're mm -hmm. cycling stuff a lot, you're moving stuff, very small amounts to make sure everything clears. Like there's a lot of time spent on the front of this. Yep. And your caster curve is dictated by a few things. One of them being at least what helps in our case is having the center mounted radius arms. Mm -hmm. There's not as much as a caster curve, meaning at full um, at full bump, we don't have as much caster as we would if we had just mounted the radius arms to the frame. Yes. So that helps with that. And then also the height at where your radius arm pivots are are gonna affect that caster curve as well. There's a lot of things you gotta think about when designing these front suspension kits, mm -hmm. but all that plays a role into your clearances and what you're gonna have to modify on the frame for everything to work. Yeah. So as far as steering goes like the swingers i wanted to have you can kind of see from the front side you can turn put, the light on put some light on it yeah see a little bit better it's like i wanted to keep the design side of it the same as everything else that's been going on as far as like what jake was doing with the beams so you can see the the overlays they all have the same similar pocket style setup is like what the beam has and then also what the beam mount has which jake did um in the computer so i just made the the swingers match that and then um, as far as like the ratios go, there, there was a lot of like playing with that as well. 
Originally I had these bolt hole locations closer together. That just lessens the steering ratio. Yep. Um, so I ended up pulling everything up, which is why the frame ended up needing to be notched. Um, right. But it's just, it's quickening things up. It's getting more steering angle out of it. And then, I mean, that's pretty much it as far as the steering goes. Um, I did do, we can look at the pitman arm real quick. It's so like pitman arm uh, was all hand built. So with that, I got a lot of people asking me about that when I posted it on Instagram. So I took a brand new stock pitman arm um, and then cut the arm off of the pitman arm, took basically the brooch section of it, machine that down in the in the lathe so it was just a perfect circle and then i built all the fabricated arm off of that so it's the same length as what a factory pitman arm would be but it's double shear so the heim has two tabs on each side of it to capture it and then it's just it is a lot stronger than what a factory pitman arm would be with just a tab yep and your idea of just using that factory pitman arm and getting it to a point where you kind of machined it down to be usable for your application is way cheaper than having something that's machined and has yeah. those splines um, put Which, into it as with, well. With this being a Ranger box still, nobody makes that for these boxes. When you start going to the Chevy boxes, people make those machined billet broached ends already that you can just buy and then build a pitman arm off of. But with this being like a kind of a one-off thing where not a lot of people are running Ranger boxes, I just took the factory pitman arm, machined it down and just did what I needed to to make this work. Um, and it should be totally fine. Like the big thing with these two is like when you do it that way, you wanna make sure like how this is, you're wrapping the entire section yep. of that factory broached end. Actually, let me see if I could get it off, I'll show you. So that's the one kind of length that you still have to complete on the steering is just the one from the pitman arm down, which you'll get to at yeah, some point so like well. I the that at the last tie rod I didn't have in because I wanted to get the motor placed in here first mm -hmm. to make sure the steering box didn't have to move based on where the motor is sitting. Um, so this is just still roughly mocked up in here. And then now that the motor's in place, I can go back, finally mount this, and then get the last tie rod connected to the steering setup. Yep. But you can see right here, like the big ticket with these is you wanna make sure you're fully wrapping um, this entire section of the pitman arm. You don't wanna just go halfway and just have a weld here and a weld here, because what ends up happening is when this pitman arm sees a bunch of load, you'll end up shearing that back section of the pitman arm off, like mm -hmm. the factory section of the pitman arm you'll just rip it right off and this thing, you won't have steering. So mm -hmm. that is like the worst case scenario on one of these trucks is not having steering yep. or not having brakes. Yep. Those are the two worst things that could possibly happen. So that's why all this stuff is just built overkill to where mm -hmm. safety is never concerned with yeah, that. Yeah, so that like all this stuff, you can see it's all boxed in. It's all 316s main tabs and then all the overlays and everything are all, I wanna say it's 14 gauge is what I use for this, mm -hmm. um, but it, it came out really nice. This is probably the best pitman arm I've made so far. So mm -hmm. I'm pretty pumped on it. Awesome. So moving back to the beam kit, mm -hmm. we saw some last videos sitting on the table. You had got this all welded up and then put on the truck. You had to do a little bit of massaging, which is a given with having the frame rail, um, how we had it. So kind of a quick background on the beam design is Christian and I took a bunch of measurements of the frame rail and mocked it up in SolidWorks and then designed the kit around that. This is the same way that we did the beam kit for the 92 F1 build. And it's not perfect. Obviously, we would much rather use a scan of the frame rail just so we know everything's going to fit perfectly. Whereas you had to do a little bit of adjustments and fitments, getting the beam pivots and everything mm -hmm. on there. So do you want to talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, so when the when we I got the beam kit all together, uh, the first thing to like get it on the truck was getting the beam mounts just tacked on the frame. Once those are on there and got the kit on the truck with the radius iron cross member in place, um, the beam mounts were just a, a little bit off and we had, I had to play with them just to get the beam, uh, the beams like close enough together to each other. Mm -hmm. So just trimming the beam mounts just a little bit to get everything to work the way that it needed to had to happen. Um, but really that was the only thing, like just a little bit of trimming on the beam mounts and then a little bit of trimming on the radius arm cross member to get the width correct. And then outside of that, like that was pretty much it. Yep. And then like we commonly say for the next one, we're going to be getting a scan of the frame rail and we're going to progress and start doing that on everything. We say that a lot on the next one, on the next one, on the next one, but I'm honestly glad we say that because that means we're progressing and we, we're finding a better way to do things. So because scanning's so accessible these days, there's no reason not to do it. So that's going to be kind of our plan of attack on the next builds. Cool. So beam kit on the truck. Like we mentioned before, it is center mounted radius arms, same way that we did the 92 F1 build. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get to the cross member back there in a second. But next, I think we should talk about engine. Yeah, so last video, 
factory firewall was still in this thing, uh, brake booster is here, like that whole deal was in place. Um, to get the motor in this truck, what I did originally was, uh, did we have the factory crossmember cut out of this thing? Yeah, we had to, because the frame was plated. So factory crossmember was cut out. I had just the bracing in the in the truck, the tubes holding everything together to make sure the frame rails didn't move. Mm -hmm. The first thing that I had to do was I cut basically the whole passenger side of the firewall off to about here and then kept it in this portion for the time being with the pedal assembly still mounted in the truck just mm -hmm. to make sure that stuff would work. Um, it doesn't, <laughs> so which I, I wasn't planning on running the factory, like any of that factory stuff, but I just wanted to see if like the pedal location would be somewhat correct. It didn't fit at all, like just test fitting the motor in here. So I ripped the rest of the firewall out, got that all cleaned up. And then the motor where it sits right now is roughly six inches further back than factory. And the only thing kind of dictating that is with how much these beams cycle, because I wanted to build the suspension first before I put the motor in it. So the suspension side of it was doing exactly what it needed to, to be in the optimal spots to get the right amount of up travel and all that stuff out of the truck. Um, because this beam kit cycles so far up, the cross member, which you can see that's in there now, it's just a tube cross cross member that's in there. Yep. Um, with that being as tight as I could possibly get it to the beams themselves at full compression, it kind of dictated where the bottom of the, like the, where the pan would basically sit on the motor mm -hmm. um, in the chassis. So that ended up meaning that the motor went back, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I was kind of expecting that and kind of wanted to do that anyways when it came to drive shaft location. Um, so it helped with that. And then also where the shifter actually ends up being in the truck. So it, it kind of solved a, a couple, a couple of issues all at one time. Definitely. Um, but yeah, so the cross member itself is all inch and three quarter, 120 wall tubing. And then the main structure that ties the two beam mounts together, which is what you want to do on these trucks because you don't want those beam mounts moving around on the frame at all. Definitely. Especially that, with how long they are too. That too. So like they hang down off the sides of the frame rail. You want to try and support that as much as you possibly can. Uh, so the, the main tube that runs across, that is inch and three quarter, 120 wall tube with inch and a half, 120 wall tube sleeved inside of it. And then there's six rosette welds holding all that together. Yep. So that will get welded to the pivots themselves. And then these two tubes run above where the beams actually come up and cycle. So that's why these have the kicks in them yep. um, to match the same profile as the beams at full compression. So it literally is as tight as you can possibly get it at full bump. And then getting the motor on top of that is kind of where this ended up sitting. Yep. And this again, is just another example of something that we learned doing our truck mm -hmm. is we had to work around the cross member so much that we were like, if we ever do this again, we're just cutting that thing out. Yeah. And, and so that, that comes down to working around the suspension being the most vital part of this. And I wanted to optimize that as much as possible. So that's why that got set up very first thing before the motor even was a thought getting that set up right. And then building everything else around that. And then, so you went ahead and remade all of the engine mounts as well, because you had sat this back so far in the truck. Yeah. How did you decide on that kind of six inch number and where exactly to locate it, this? Honestly, it came down to just the clearance to the pan. So like okay. right now there's a good amount of clearance here to everything. It is on poly bushings. It's not solid mounted. I didn't want to go that route. It had poly bushings in it before with the old setup. Um, so it is still running the fat, like the, the auto fab, at least on the, the engine side, it's running the auto fab pivots, mm -hmm. the, the, the mounts. engine mounts. Yep. And then I just built the new mounts that come off of the, off of the frame rail. And these aren't done yet. I still need to plate in the whole inside, but I'm going to wait to do that until the motor's back out of the truck and I can get to all that stuff easily. But it's at least the engine mounts are there and the trans mounts there to at least be able to hold everything in place. And it's not, it's not going anywhere. It's welded enough to where this stuff is locked in solid exactly where it's going to go. Um, the only thing is with this truck and with how this motor setup is, uh, with these V6s, they're definitely a weird shape and nothing is symmetrical with them. Mm -hmm. So if you look, it might be kind of hard, but like if you look at this truck and this is how they are from factory too, this motor is actually offset to the passenger side. Okay. So you stuck with that. Yes. Gotcha. And you, you have to. So there's no way around that. And the only reason I say that is because as far as header clearance goes, like if you look at where the factory manifolds are, if you reference both sides to the frame rails, the manifolds are basically exactly the same side to side as far as where the frame rails are. Gotcha. So that kind of dictated that. I needed to have the optimal header clearance. I needed to have clearance to where the, the box is at now, which everything works out great. Um, and then also like the, the starters on the driver's side, you need more 
clearance, especially because this truck is gonna have three pedals in it, not just two. Mm -hmm. It's gonna get extremely tight on the driver's side as far as foot, foot control room goes. So having this thing stay to that factory offset kind of deal was way more beneficial. And then the trans side is centered in the back of the truck. And I wanna say when we measure across the frame rails, I want to say it's off by like three quarters of an three quarters of an inch at the crank, okay. and then it's centered in the back. So like okay, it's so it's very minor. Very minor, yeah. yes. While the engine is out, Ryan did do a few things to freshen it up. Yes. Should we leave that to Ryan to discuss in a future video, or do you kind of know some of the things that he I did on that? I know roughly what he did. He he replaced a bunch of the accessories on the front of it, um, and then he realistically just cleaned this thing up because before that motor never came out of this truck. Um, and it was just covered in oil and grease and just dirt from just being in the desert and all that stuff So I knew since I was gonna have to be remounting it and this being the last thing which we touched on in the last video This being the last thing that hasn't been touched in the truck at this point It was ideal to pull this thing out have him just go through make sure everything's clean So I'm not trying to work around a dirty gross motor um, He he basically just did all the gaskets like main gaskets okay, cleaned so it up, And then just a couple of the accessories on the motor as well Cool. And then it looks like you did freeze plugs on there as well, mm -hmm. just to freshen all that up. And yes. then again, just going through, freshening up, painting stuff, doing gaskets, like it's just one of those touches that's going to kind of finish out the truck and shows that everything's been touched and everything's been cleaned up and yep. it just finishes everything out nicely. Yeah. Obviously it wasn't intended to cut as much of the firewall and the cab off as, I, as, I have, as I has happened, but what was going to happen, but th this is definitely more than what I've done previously. Uh, I have done another Ranger where I did a complete firewall on it before, and I did cut it basically all the way to this section here, which is a nice clean surface to be able to start a fresh firewall off of. So that's pretty much like the optimal part to like cut it to. On the other one that I did, there is a big box section here underneath the cowl that kind of holds like the windshield wiper um, actuators and all that stuff. I, I decided to cut it out on this one and I'm going to make a beauty plate that covers this in to, to seal this off. Mm -hmm. um, but this just ended up working out a lot better too, especially because we pushed the motor back. Uh, there's no way that the intake would have cleared any of that stuff. So this just gives a nice, good open slate for me to be able to build the engine cage off of because I can get to all these points up in here very easily, be able to fully weld everything and then tie it back in to everything that's already built and then also be able to build a nice firewall off of all this stuff and not have a bunch of factory crap up here that I'm trying to work off of. And it's really cool without the firewall on there right now, just seeing through the truck and seeing all the work that's been done on it. Yeah, so I mean, that's pretty much it for the front. We can- Let's we jump can... on the cab a little bit. There yeah. are some things to talk about in there. Yeah. Moving into the cab, again, the first thing that you notice is just how much everything has been moved back into the truck. And we did kind of touch on the shift relocation and how that has helped with that a little bit. Do you want to elaborate on that just a little bit further? Yeah, so in a previous video, we had just the, the his new PRP seat sat in the truck and we had Ryan just test fit and see how he sat in the truck with the new seats. Um, and when we did that, the engine and the trans were in the factory location still. And then we had the shifter on there and with him in the truck with his back all the way against the back of the seat, kind of how it would be if he had his five point harnesses fully tightened up where he could not move in the truck. He had to reach pretty far to get to first gear. So I knew that the tr ideally the trans needed to come back a little bit just from that alone. So us having to move the engine back for everything going on in the front kind of fixed that situation just alone, just by doing that. Um, so now it's in a lot more ideal spot. And then also too, I was mentioning that the back side of the trans um, was not really ideal before either. And the reason for that is because it was right on the edge of needing to be a two-piece drive shaft or a, compared to a one-piece drive shaft, with ne which now it will be running. Mm -hmm. um, so before the front drive shaft would have been really short uh, and then the carrier bearing would have been there and then it would have went to the back drive shaft. But now because the motor's pushed back as far as it is, we're able to just go straight from the trans one-piece shaft all the way down to the rear end, which is a lot more ideal. Um, the only thing with these five-speed transmissions that's kind of weird is the tail housings on these. You cannot buy a fixed yoke tail housing like you can for like a Turbo 400, which is what we're running. Um, so to, to kind of remedy that and take away the slip that's in the back of the trans here on the output, um, basically what I'm going to have to do is drill the end of the output shaft, tap it for a half-inch bolt, drill a hole through the factory uh, yoke, and then bolt the yoke directly to the tail housing. 
um, and that will make it into a fixed gear kind of setup. And then from there, I can just build or have the custom draft shaft made with the slip in the shaft from there, which is typical for these trucks that have this amount of travel in them. So that will delete this whole section, correct? And then just add a fixed well, it, yoke to that? Yeah, so the, everything will stay here the way it is. Right now what happens is the factory drive shaft has a tubing about this long that slides into the shaft or into the, the transmission on the, the output shaft here. So to get rid of the, the slip here, because what ends up happening when you have the slip at the drive shaft right here is when this is cycling so much travel, it's just jamming that tail or the, the drive shaft into the transmission. And this tail housing being as small as it is on these transmissions, it's just asking for problems because you're you're adding a lot more load at different angles, especially when the truck's fully drooped out under acceleration and it's trying to come back up. It's cycling into the tail housing and you end up just destroying the tail housings on these trucks. So when you go to a fixed yoke, nothing moves on the trans side. Yep. And then all the slip is in the drive shaft. So the drive shaft is taking that load instead of the tail housing on the on the transmission. Cool. And then you could see it a little bit up front, but the radius arm cross member is completely in the truck. Mm -hmm. Looks like you added a little bit of an overlay on the frame on that side to assist with that. Yes. And then welded that all in. All this was designed in the computer with the front suspension kit and is now on the truck. And then one thing that we had previously in the videos as well are these tubes kind of coming down to this intermediate tube. Yes. And then you've gone through and fully connected that to the radius arm cross member as well mm -hmm. and mounted the transmission off of that. So that was kind of the intentions the whole time and you kind of knocked it out of the park on all that. One thing I do want to mention is that you've kept in mind and I've kept in mind with the design of the suspension as well of just having it so we're not pulling water in any, yeah. any points or any locations. So on the bottom of the radius arm cross member, there is a drain slit in that. So if water kind of gets back in here, it'll drain out of that. And then Christian's gone ahead and made sure there's not going to be any locations inside of this for water to pull up and eventually corrode um, some of the stuff and start rusting. Yeah. And you've made this all bolt in as well. Mm -hmm. And that just makes it easier for service and removing stuff as well. So really cool that you added that all in and just have that load pathway for everything to transfer through. Yeah, because you got to think like when you go to center mounted radius arms like this, everything meets up underneath the transmission. So mm -hmm. I didn't know it once the motor was placed where it is now, I can kind of figure out where the transmission mount was going to be. I didn't know exactly where that was going to be in relation to the chassis. I was actually thinking that the transmission mount was going to be more over top of the, the actual radius arm cross member. And I was just going to be able to build something up right off the top of that. Mm -hmm. But because it's pushed back as far as it is, that ended up actually being almost dead center in between the radius arm cross member and where this tube already was originally. Right. So I knew that when you go to center mounted radius arms to be able to get the transmission out of the truck, if you needed to later, you have to pull the radius arms and the radius arm cross member to be able to get the trans out of the truck. So with the, the trans cross member being kind of intermediate in between the two, I knew that the tubes coming from here to the radius arm cross member had to be removable as well. Everything has to be the same, whether you solid mount everything with literally just steel to steel, or you do poly mounts like this, which to me, this is the best way to do it because you still get a little bit of that, the flex and everything. And then also too, it takes a lot of the vibration out of the chassis as well. Definitely. So if you solid mount all this stuff, when the engine's running, you feel every single thing coming from the engine. So that depending, there could be circumstances where that's ideal and you can feel stuff that's going on with the engine. In this case, you, I don't want to feel any of that. We're not going to do anything other than the poly mount because then everything has too much flex. Um, but this is the best way to do it. Like I said, the engine side mounts are from Autofab. This, the mount that actually bolts to the transmission that has the, the poly bushing in it, that is from Autofab as well from his old setup. And then I just made the actual base that all that stuff mounts to. And then you carried through with the three holes in that as well mm -hmm. that you can see just to kind of carry to that. keep everything the same. Yep. Just have that flow throughout the truck yep. and those little design features yeah, so as well. Like, trailing arms have the three holes. The out, if you look at the outside of the pivot box, that has the three holes on the overlays. Yep. The shock, mount shock mounts the have holes. them. Yeah. So it's just, I'm trying to keep the same flow going through the entire truck to keep everything the same. Definitely. And then, so you kind of have a blank canvas to go through and do all of your panel work in here. At what point do you think that's going to start to occur? Uh, not until the entire engine cage and then all the tube work for the firewall and the transmission tunnel is in place. So okay. like, as far as like panel work goes, that won't be for a while. I'm going to, the next thing that I'm doing is everything for the engine cage, getting shocks mounted and all that stuff. And we just got a radiator, which we can show in a little bit, but 
that will be the next focus is getting all that stuff in. Um, and then I can start on transmission kind of tunnel that will go in here um, to kind of tie everything together. And then once all the main chassis is there, you'll really start to see like how the firewall and the flooring and the back wall, all that stuff kind of ties together. And it, it, it'll all make sense right now. It's just big open spaces and it's kind yeah. of hard to kind of visualize that stuff um, from the viewer standpoint. But I know like once all that tube work is in there, it will all make sense. It'll be very easy to connect the dots basically at that point for all the tin work to go back in this thing. Which it's definitely a big undertaking cutting so much out and then having to repanel it back in, but it really opens up a lot of previous constraints to where you have a lot of freedom with things. One being access to weld stuff like you had mentioned, but also exhaust where you want that to go, putting the seats exactly where you want that stuff to go, moving the engine where you want it to go. So it, it really allows you to have a freedom with a lot of those decisions where you previously are designing around the cab. And well, you're, there's two things, there's time management and final product, like what it looks like when it's finally done. I'm not gonna, as far as time management goes, working around all the factory, like flooring and firewall and back wall, it takes way more time trying to work around keeping that stuff and you don't get as optimal of a pro like end product when you're done because you can't get to certain things. You're struggling to reach certain spots when you're welding something. Like when you just blow it all out, when you get to this point and you just blow everything out, you're able to get to everything a lot easier. Your product comes out a lot nicer. Yes, there's a little bit more time in like doing all the tin work to panel everything back in, but your final product end up, ends up looking a lot better than it would if you just tried to use what was already there. And it, it, it just turns out way more optimal because you can get the clearances for the firewall that you need for tire clearance, for the engine to be pushed back the way that it needs to be. You're not just doing patch panels on everything on the firewall and it looks half-assed. Like everything will look very like the way that it should doing it this way, which is how I want to do things from here on out. Cool. So in terms of inside of the cab, is that most of the updates in here? No. There... So you can see outside of the frame, I've, I ended up paneling or uh, overlaying the entire rest of the outside of the frame. The factory body mounts are gone on the front side of the cab. So now there is no factory body mounts holding this cab on the chassis. Everything will be tied in as far as welding goes. Okay. Um, also too, you can see I added these outside stringer tubes, which you can see on your side. Yep. It tucks in to the, I cut the factory uh, body, the floor section, cut it in a nice straight line where I needed it to be. And then now this tube comes in and runs directly in line with that. And it's actually, you can see it on that side, it's tacked right to that, to the cab. Right. So it leads for a nice spot to be able to get silicon bronze in there. It's just MIG tacked right now just to hold everything together, but that will get silicon bronzed all the way along that seam. And then this tube lends for a nice spot for the, the new floor to be able to come off of right. uh, when that time comes. Cool. Yeah. I didn't even notice you would cut out the whole, whole front cab mounts and everything. So yeah, this so thing's that's... really, it's almost a slip on cab at this point. It's not, but like you don't have much left of the if, original if stuff. If I knew what this was going to be like to this extent, it legitimately could have just been a cab that got slid onto this thing Yeah, mm -hmm. at this point. Um, another thing too is like, I don't think these were done on the last one, but right. this is all patched in. So like that, I had to do that first because it kind of like a, a you got to think a couple steps ahead when you're doing things. This needs to be patched in because the way that this will end up being paneled in for the flooring, that needs to be done first because you will see that from when you're looking from the back side of the truck, that will be something you'll see. And that was a big open cavity. Mm -hmm. So those needed to be patched in all cleaned up and then blended out. So everything looks all good. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a couple tubes thrown in here now that weren't in there before, but Outside of that, the majority of it was just getting engine trans in here, the radius arm cross member, and then the trans mount. This is like, we're really starting to see that this is like a full, almost like a full chassis up build. Pretty like much. there's not much left of the original stuff at this point. It's cab, engine transmission, and then frame rail from here forward. And that's really about it. From here on out, after, again, experience, knowing how far this thing has gotten, this was not the intention of this truck originally. But if... If I know everyone's famous order, last words, yeah, if, if it's the snowball, but if, if I know a truck will be getting to this point again in the future, I'm not starting with a factory frame. I will, I will build a chassis for it and just slide a cab over it. And then if I have to hand make all the cage work to it, it is what it is. But working around even just the factory frame rail is not ideal. I'd rather have just built an entire chassis at this point, but. And that's beneficial for everyone. That's beneficial for you. Saves you a lot of time, but it also saves the customer a lot of money. Time management and final end product. It, yep. That's at the end of the day, that's what everything comes down to. Yep.
Cool. So let's jump to the back and let's talk about some of the stuff you've been working on back there. Okay. So first thing I see is the jack spin mounted. So this was previously kind of a void that you had. Space, yeah. yeah, that you had to add a bunch of options to. So do you want to explain your ideas behind what you wanted in here and how you carried that out? Yeah. So I knew when I built this section of the back half, I knew that with the size of this fuel cell that there's going to be this, this empty spot here. And I knew just by looking at the space of it, that it would fit a jack perfectly, just kind of in this little cavity above where the rear end comes up at full compression. There was enough space between there and the, the tops of these tubes to be able to have the jack sit in there and then the jack handle. And then um, basically once I got the jack in here, dead center, because I wanted to kind of keep the weight centered in the chassis and not have it shifted over to one side. That's a big thing with these trucks is you want to kind of try and keep as much of it centered left to right as you can because if you start loading one side of the chassis with a bunch of stuff you're going to have to offset it somehow on the other side with something else so keeping big components like a jack or the batteries you can kind of see here there's a battery on each side um, just kind of keeping everything symmetrical side to side is the best way of going about things um, but once the jack was in here there was still space on each side and there was really nowhere else to put fluids so what i did is i ended up making these little fluid containers that hold this side will hold a coolant, a gallon of coolant, and then this side over here will have three, uh, just one quart containers. So that will be either engine oil, trans fluid, um, brake fluid, whatever he wants to run in there, he'll be able to run in there. But it was not just like a buy something off the shelf kind of thing. The jack mount on here is all hand built, which I think we might have touched on at one point. Um, and then also these containers are all hand built too. So trying to keep with that concept of build it yourself. Yep. Um, all all in-house. So yeah. all this aluminum stuff, was that cut on the plasma? Yep, right here. Cool. And then you clean that all up, welded that together, mm -hmm. have these nice, clean, just little plate mounts that go off of the chassis. Okay, and all... What's on the side right there? Got the three holes. Okay, well, you're, <laughs> you're doing different size holes now, so you're kind of switching it up a little bit. <laughs> but awesome to see that theme carry out through the rest of the truck. This will all be paneled in. You won't see that. Yeah. And then with this storage space, are you planning on sealing this off or having it closed off to the environment? Yeah, so the, the sides will be paneling just like no, a normal truck would be. And then this top, it'll have a panel that comes over here. It'll have a latch on it. This will open up. You'll be able to get to all this stuff. But at least that way, this is all out of the elements from if it's raining, because this truck's going to be outside. So if mm -hmm. it's raining, nothing will get on anything in here. And it'll kind of keep dust down to a minimum. It's still going to get dust because there's not going to be anything on this side. But okay. Um, there will be at least a, a top on it. So you don't see the stuff either. That's another thing with this being outside in the elements, you driving it to work, all this stuff is not visible. It'll have a lid on it. You won't be able to see any of it. So that's another side of it too. But there will also be basically from this sway bar tube to where the center section is of this back half, I'm going to build another tray here that will hold basically tool storage. Okay. And then this will end up having a panel across the top of this as well. And this back section will have a hinge on it as well to be able to get to that and to the two batteries, so. So it's kind of funny. People decide to go one of two ways, typically with the back halves. Um, and it's not always like this, but you see this a lot. It's either fuel cell here, storage here, or storage here, fuel cell up here, which yeah. we have the the uh, we'll ladder to that. Yeah, this, yeah. yeah. Um, which going with this, having the fuel cell back, it's kind of generally, it's a generally accepted role that you want to have as much weight as possible behind the rear axle to help keep this thing on the rear end and keep the front up. Yep. Um, and this is a change up from what we did, but it's just funny to see that it's literally flipped and mirrored from our truck to where you have the storage now up front. Yeah. Well, it's again, back to experience, us having our fuel cell behind the cab, you don't get as much weight change when you start to go low mm -hmm. on, on fuel. This, you have a little bit more of that fluctuation because it is all the way at the back of the chassis. Granted, it's really not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. I would much rather have the weight back here, especially from shop tuning our truck. We are very limited on weight behind the axle, which is hurting the performance of our truck a lot. So knowing that based off of ours, I wanted to put the fuel cell back here, um, have all that weight behind the chassis or behind the axle center line. And then it, with this being such a short wheelbase, I really, and knowing how much weight there is on the front, I wanted to pull everything as far back on this chassis as I could um, because it's, it, it is very short. So that having that ratio front to back is going to be very crucial on this thing. Cool. And then one other thing that I just noticed while you were talking was the jack handle mount. Mm -hmm. So 
those just slide on. You Did you weld these bolts into like a tube or something? Yeah, so these, like the, the handles, it's, it's just a bolt that comes down and I'll end up having wing nuts on this too. Mm -hmm. I have seen setups before where the, it's a similar setup, but these jack handles end up just going down onto a pin and then there's like a pull pin or something that, that holds these down. The only issue with that is you get a lot of rattle out of this stuff. And the most annoying thing on a free runner, in my opinion, is hearing your jack rattle or your jack handles rattle, depending on how they're mounted. Mm -hmm. So the way that this all is set up, you can see on like all the, the fluid containers, I have Velcro set up on all these. Yep. I'm going to do a similar Velcro setup on this, the actual jack. So you don't hear any <laughs> of this crap. This, is, this right here. It's the worst. The most it's the annoying worst. thing you can ever have on a truck outside of bypass click, which a lot of people complain about. Yep. Um, but that is something that you can actually like fix yourself. Bypass noise, you just have to deal with. There's no way around that for right now. now for yeah, for, for now. Yeah. Um, and then same thing with the jack handle. So this will just have wing nuts. I think after Jake and I were talking about it, he's gonna 3D print me some little pieces that go on here. And then the, the jam nut will, or the wing nut will go onto that. So it has a nice flat surface to mount on. And then same thing with this, with the handle for the jack. So this yep. needs to sit over at an angle like this. So I'm just gonna have him make me a nice little piece that slides in here and holds this down. So the trunk lid sits how it needs to. Yep, so just a wedge for that and some isolators for that, just to keep the noise down and vibrations out of the truck. Yep. And then one other thing I noticed is that you added the whip mount yes. um, to the rear structure as well. And then is that pretty much up to date on the back or what pretty else you've been working there, on back here? The fuel pump and filters are in here as well, just tacked onto the frame rail. Um, very similar setup, or it's the exact same setup that we're running on our truck. It's just a Bosch 044 style pump. And then it's got two filters. It's a 10 micron and a 100 micron filter on each side of it. Okay. Um, and that's just tucked up in the frame rail, just kind of trying to figure out where all the electric electronic stuff goes because you're gonna have to run wiring to that fuel pump. Right. Um, so Ryan can start coming, same thing with like the wood mount is on here now. All that stuff is here. So now Ryan can start figuring out as far as wiring goes, what needs, where all the wiring and stuff needs to go so you can start laying out a harness for the back of this thing. Cool. One other thing to mention is the shock package for the front. Do you wanna explain what's happening with these currently or what the plan of attack is for that? Yeah, so we're running, we've mentioned this too in the previous video, we're running the coilovers that the truck already had, which is a 2.5 by 14 inch coilover with uh, compression adjusters on the reservoirs. And then he does have new 3.0 16 inch bypass that are going on the front as well. It's a five tube layout overlapping tubes. And then the, the mid compression tube is a bigger diameter just to help with fluid flow. And then same thing with the bigger reservoir port on there. Um, so that stuff is going on the front. Uh, I already did kind of cycle this thing up to bump and it's gonna be very tight as far as shock package clearance goes. One thing we didn't touch on is how narrow this truck is. So the rear of the truck is 76 inches wide, outside tire to outside tire. Typically like our rear end, just the wheel mounting surface before you put tires on that truck is 74 inches. Mm -hmm. So this is only two inches wider to the outsides of the tires. Yep. So it's very narrow in comparison to a lot of other things. So to get the front to somewhat match the rear end, we're at, a, I think it's 81 or 82 inch track width. Yeah, right around there, yeah. Um, so it is very narrow for what a Ranger typically is. So just to get the clearancing that we need for the shocks, we're gonna have to do some tricky stuff with top cap clocking. Um, and just, I'm, I'm my big concern now after cycling everything is the bypass not sticking out of the hood. So I'll be, we're bumping this truck out very yeah. high. It's running a decent size shock being a 16 inch bypass. So there's gonna be some, clearance things going on in the front um but it's not anything that can't be worked out i just i noticed that just by quickly going over that stuff the other day that it's going to be very tight and it's going to be a which, lot of clearance issues to the hood which is always the challenge with mm -hmm. i don't i mean we don't have much experience with the arm trucks but with the beam trucks there's always a battle for packaging yeah. with shock packaging steering like it's always everything's so close and you really have to fine tune it to yeah. make everything solved this, this truck for sure with the track with track width being so short or narrow uh, this will be the tightest packaging truck that I've dealt with so far, which is, it'll be a challenge. It'll be cool to, to kind of overcome that. Um, but it's definitely going to take a little bit more time than, than what it would normally be if it was a wider truck. Cool. And looks like you have some parts to get going on the front in the future with the radiator being here now. And I'm sure by the next update, all that's going to be installed on the truck. And we'll okay. have something to talk so about there. The, another thing that I needed to be able to start on the engine cage, because the front of the engine cage is going to kind of dictate where the radiator is going. I did need a radiator. Uh, on our truck, we're running a 31 by 19, which is kind of a standard for radiators in these trucks. 
this being a, a Ranger and this running a three piece conventional front end and not running like a Raptor conversion one piece clip, mm -hmm. uh, the front of the truck, like the grill portion of it where the hood slopes down to is very short in height. So we had to do something a little bit different as far as radiator goes. Um, and I went back and forth with Tyler over at CarTech on what would be the most ideal setup. Um, and this ended up being what I went with. This is a 31 by 16 inch radiator. So it's 31 inches wide by 16 inches in height. And this is just outside of, it basically sits on top of the frame rails. So it, it sits on top of the frame and right underneath the hood pretty much is what it's gonna end up being. But it's a similar kind of setup to what we're running with uh, the 31 by 19 where it has the two uh, small fans on it. I believe these are 14 inch fans. Um, so it should be it should be plenty for this V6. And then I also wanted to set it up to where none of this had to be changed when he goes to a V8 later. Yep. So I tried to fit the biggest radiator that he could possibly put in this truck right now um, without there being just ridiculous clearance issues. And I didn't want to go too small where it works okay with the V6 but it's not enough when he decides to go to a V8 later. Right. Um, and a bunch of stuff had to be changed down the road. So this cool. should be a very good option for what he's doing. We don't have a single issue with, with cooling on our truck. Um, our truck actually runs very cold in comparison to being hot most of the time. So this should be totally fine, especially for this V6. Yep. He'll be able to flip the fans on when he wants to, if the thing's running really cold. Um, and then it should be totally fine. Cool. Well, that's kind of... I guess the update on the truck and yeah. walking through everything on it, is there anything else you want to go over or is that a good no, place to wrap it? it? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's going to be done for the previous video, but, or for the next video, but we'll, uh, we'll go over that in the next one. Cool. Well, I think that's a good place to stop this one then. If you guys liked it, please like, comment, and subscribe. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.